by Tommy Garrett with Somewhere in Time. Tonight's feature is Scream of the Wolf. It stars Clint Walker and Peter Graves. Clint Walker is, of course, one of my favorite actors. But our guest tonight is none other than Wyatt Earp. Yes, you guys, it's Wyatt Earp. Hugh O'Brien, the actor, is here to discuss with us his interest in movies and his wonderful humanitarian work and his, his most positive and person you'll ever meet. So anyway, when I come back, you'll meet Hugh O'Brien again, and we'll be back after a break. Hi, I'm Tommy Garrett, the host of Somewhere in Time, and tonight's feature is Scream of the Wolf, and it stars Hugh O'Brien's friends, Clint Walker and Peter Graves, and we're here at Mr. O'Brien's beautiful home in Beverly Hills, California today. He was so gracious. He and his beautiful, significant other, Victoria, or is it Virginia? Well, she'll... Either one, too. Either one, no. <laughs> well, she's, she's Virginia. She's Virginia. She's beautiful, like the state. My partner. And she's, she's wonderful. She and, is. And today we're here to talk to Hugh about, of course, his friends Clint Walker and Peter Graves. But we mainly want to talk to him about his distinguished career. And in, in addition to that, I think we'll start with this wonderful organization called Hobie International, which Hugh founded, and he can tell you more about it. And at the end of the show, I'll give this address to somewhere in time. And if you're interested in finding out more about this organization, please just send me a letter, and we'll be glad to co connect you with Hugh's organization, and you can help out in any way. Well, in the meantime, they can look up the website. It's HOB y.org for organization and H O B Y is pronounced Hobie and that's short for my name Hugh O'Brien Youth, there it is It's a wonderful organization and I've worked with you on it in the past and you, you've done so much work Hugh with the youth um, you know, Well I couldn't do it if I didn't have the thousands of volunteers we have out there and uh, they like uh, myself do not get paid they give everything uh, in terms of time and they raise money and they put the programs on uh, at the state level throughout the United States and about uh, nine other countries. Fifty states? All fifty. Wow, amazing. Whatever number we have, plus the District of Columbia. But there are anywhere from a uh, uh, minimum of one in every state, Delaware, Rhode Island, Connecticut, uh, Wyoming, and Alaska can get all their kids into one location, but when you get over 210th graders together, the energy level boy out of the room. So most of the states have two, three, four, in the case of Texas, uh, five sites. Wow. And uh, again, all run by volunteers. Well, it's amazing. I just, we have this beautiful photo of you with some children from Iraq, I believe. Yeah, they're not children, they're, they're young adults. They're young adults, I should yeah, say. They don't like to be close to them. <laughs> but that was, uh, that's the first uh, time anybody got uh, young people from Iraq uh, over to the United States, and they uh, went to our uh, World Leadership Congress, which is the cherry on top of the cake wow. of all the local seminars, and that was in July of 2004. And that, that came about because of the fact that we had, uh, turns out we had three alumni of the Hobie program on the uh, our provisional coalition authority uh, over in Iraq, and they wanted to put on uh, the motivational program, Hobie motivational program for what turned out to be about 210 high schools in the really? uh, Baghdad area. And from that, well, I helped him do that, and of course the State Department uh, worked with me and with them to put it on, and uh, they held uh, the three-day program over there. And then they narrowed that down to the five guys and gals that, uh, that you see in here, and I don't think you'll see any faces any happier than that. And there are three teachers here, if you want to show them that. Yeah, I do. And the, Sad thing, uh, well, first of all, that was a great experience having these young people with our young people from every corner of the United States plus 20 other countries. And uh, the communication now between them is really fantastic. Of course, you can do that because of the uh, internet, email, so forth. The three teachers, uh, the two ladies with the, the uh, bonnets, or whatever you call them, and then the gentleman back here, the uh, sad thing about this picture is that this lady was in charge. She just was a magnificent human being. And they were here uh, in this country for over two weeks. They went back, and she uh, 
uh, applied to, to go to work uh, to help in the educational, redevelopment of the educational system over there, uh, which is, uh, they're just doing a great job. And uh, for whatever reason, she was kidnapped uh, about, uh, I guess it was about four months ago, and about five, five days later, she was strangled. So oh. that kind of brings home the tremendous amount of uh, horror that's going over there in that country still. It's and, uh, sad. It's going to be that way for a long time. And she was such a positive person. Well, she was. Yeah. Wow. And these guys and gals were very positive. But the one criteria besides being uh, 15 or 16, uh, no older, which is the age of our 10th, 10th graders, high school sophomores, uh, they also all had to be able to speak English wow. and communicate in English, and they were just great. My uh, dad was a horse marine in World War One. I. I knew the Marine Corps him before I knew the National Anthem. And when I enlisted in the Marine Corps, uh, 1943, I was 17. And uh, right out of boot camp, they made me a drill instructor. And uh, so I'm very proud to be the youngest uh, drill instructor in, not only in the Marine Corps, but any branch of the service. Wow, that's amazing. No, not necessarily. I think it is. Well, they had to get uh, anybody that had, in 43, anybody that had any time uh, in the Corps had stripes and needed them over in the Pacific. And if you could uh, take them to the mess hall without marching through the barracks, you got the job. So that's what they uh, assigned me to do, and they did it. Well, you know, you're world famous for your role as Wyatt Earp, and he really was a stand-up guy, someone that people could always depend on to do the right thing. Um, you know, so many... He was in real life, too, from what well, I've Well, I've heard that, too. Um, I have to just say that, you know, it, was it a lot of fun as well as... What was it, it like was, playing? Uh, there was a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of hard work to it. We did about 18 pages of dialogue a day. And, uh, I'd be up and at it at about 5 in the morning, and I wouldn't get home until about 9 o'clock at night, and they'd have to try to memorize 18 pages for the next day. But uh, that was the job, and I did the best I could. I had a, we had a great crew, and uh, it was the first adult Western on television. And by that, uh, the, what that meant was that it was, uh, in no disrespect, it was not a Gene Autry or, or a Roger show. Uh, uh, it was the people wore the clothing that they actually did. Uh, our wardrobe on the set and the, the parts we did were actually what they wore, whether it was Dodd City or Wichita or Tombstone. And uh, the outfit that I wore, I don't think we have the picture there, but those were with the best and everything. And there was a frock coat. Well, I'll we'll find one, maybe put it on the show later. You can see it. But that's what the mayor wore, or the guy that ran the uh, hardware store or something. Uh, there weren't uh, polka dot shirts and uh, <laughs> Uh, very, very few white hats. Yeah. Matter of fact, I almost lost the show uh, because I insisted on wearing um, a black hat, not a white hat. Wow. And uh, if you want to do authentic uh, things for this show and, and uh, so forth, I said like, the last thing that my other would, uh, would wear uh, would be a white hat. Anyway, they finally said, well, okay. And, uh, and I think that the wardrobe uh, and the dialogue the kind of uh, dialogue they had, people actually said back then, uh, a little bit different than Deadwood on TV. Uh, they didn't have as many four-letter words in it. Amazing. But uh, I had to come up with a simple explanation of the adult question, so uh, I'm going to have to take a long time trying to explain it. And the simple explanation of an adult, uh, an adult Western is that the cowboy uh, still kisses a horse, but he worries about it. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Well, you know, you worked with so many people, and you've been friends with everyone, seems to love well, My best friends was Gene Autry. As a matter of fact, the first film I ever did was uh, with Gene Autry. I have a, a picture of the two of us together. I'll give it to you later to use if you want to. He was a wonderful man, and also one of the brightest guys that I ever knew, and a tremendous businessman. Uh, he wound up owning the uh, yeah. baseball team, and he he had uh, owned a couple of television stations. He was a very 
smarter guy than he was, and you're smart too. You work, I don't know about that. You worked with Clint Walker in a Cheyenne episode or two as well, didn't you? Mm, no. You did. Well, I know you have worked with him in something. We did. Uh, well, we were both. We both had the same business manager. Uh, and Clint was a terrific guy. I mean, he still is. He's still with us. And uh, uh, Jim Arness and those guys, uh, Jim Garner, they were all you know quite wonderful people. Yeah. And one of the people that worked on our show, who I really was quite fond of, was a, a fond of, was Morgan Woodward. He played oh, Shotgun Gibbs. And, he's uh, still alive. Yeah, and I'd be, I think it'd be great if you did. I do with him. too. I love Morgan. Great guy. Yeah. I met him in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, That's in the United States. In the United States, not in Finland. And he was... <laughs> I was at this at a service station in, uh, in Charlottesville, and he pulled over. I was so starstruck. Anyhow, and pumping gas. He know he pulled over. I was pumping gas, and he pulled over and asked me where the airport was. He had been in town for the um, Walton. Mountain Museum um, because he did some episodes of the Waltons and they asked him to come and be a guest there. But he, the airport was hard to find, so I took him to the airport. Oh, probably because Charlottesville is an old town that was, and as they built it, it seems that they didn't plan for traffic <laughs> and and the highways don't <laughs> don't meet us. As well as they do here in LA and New York. So. Okay, so you're suggesting I go to Washington D.C. and drive down? Yes, I'll pick you up. <laughs> I'm always trying to get you in town. So when you, um, do you know Peter Graves? Sure. Do you like their work? Do you think? Do you respect them as actors? And I'm uh, sure that I respect uh, the people that I've mentioned uh, even more as a human yeah. being. And, uh, yeah. Uh, believe it or not, I don't care how big you are in the business or whatever, we all have to go to the same job. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, and those that don't are, are full of it, and they stay full of it. And they stay full of it. Did you find each role hard to get into? Because each, all of the work you did was so different from each project. Well, uh, let me tell you one of the, one of the great privileges that this business offers, uh, and that is to, uh, and I've played many people yes. uh, from Thomas Jefferson to Washington, uh, people that really uh, were outstanding in the development of our con uh, country. Uh, I've played uh, all kinds of different roles, and I've always uh, not only prided myself, but I felt it was very necessary because of the way I'm made up to read as much as I could about the individual and become really informed, not just about, you know, the stuff that you read about them, but the inner life that they led, their families and how they handled different situations. And that helped me tremendously in, uh, in trying to give a, a true vision of that individual when I was given the role to play it. And, and that's the fun of the business. I did a tremendous amount of research on Wyatt Earp and we had the privilege of the man who was authorized by Wyatt Earp uh, to do his life story and the life and legend of Wyatt Earp. Stuart Lake uh, was our uh, uh, advisor on the show. And uh, he had spent, you know, over a period of five years from about 1924, uh, 23, 1923, 24, to 1929 when Wyatt died. Uh, meeting with him and getting different uh, parts of the story for the book. And Wyatt lived a fantastic life, and he died here in Los Angeles on 13th Street. A little bungalow, and his, he passed away with his boots off. In other words, he had a, a, a normal uh, leaving of the world. He uh, uh, was quite a human being, uh, and his wife, Josie, uh, there's, if we have time later, we'll talk about that because it was a, quite, a, quite an interesting story about how they met and then uh, what they did and where she was from. Well, it's interesting because you know, I really do think a lot of these shows like Wider, um, Cheyenne, Gunsmoke, they're all 
getting a resurgence there there's such an interest and in not just on TV land but also just well the advantage that, uh, that those shows had that we didn't have uh, is that they all eventually were done in, they did it, were able to do them some of them in color uh, we never did all of us, all of us were in black and white and that's caused a problem in terms of uh, really getting uh, the replay and the producers didn't want to spend the extra five bucks to uh, five thousand actually to to uh, film it in color but by the way the the, the dvd set uh mino is putting out a four uh, uh, dvd set which will be uh, out there and on the market in uh, i guess about the middle of uh, this month or uh, certainly the first part of next month and uh, so that will be out there for anybody that's interested in taking a look at it. And they also have a bunch of interviews in there that are interesting from people that actually worked in the show, uh, including myself. And uh, uh, by the way, if you're interested, take a look at our webpage. You can uh, buy it uh, from us, and uh, that is hoby.org. And it's really, they did a great job. There are 26 episodes. And they used major, uh, the major, four major uh, areas of history in terms of Wyatt's career: Wichita, Dodge, uh, then uh, Tombstone, and then the, the final episodes are the ones that led up to, and then the final of the uh, gunfight at the OK Corral, which was quite has become quite famous. Yes, it has. Do you um, find that baby boomers remember you more, or, or are younger people today because of Hobie? Oh, dot org. <laughs> well, I, I would much rather have them know me because of Hobie, which is what I've only got spots in time. But uh, you have to be almost uh, 50 or older to uh, uh, remember and sing the Wyatt Earp show because we were on from 55 through uh, 61. And uh, so anybody younger uh, probably didn't see the show. But there are a lot of other things that I did, which uh, they may have seen. I'm the very proud father of the governor of California. Did you know that? Yes. You did? Yes. How did you know that? <laughs> I've heard a lot about you. <laughs> no, uh, anyway, the, uh, the, uh, that's Arnold Schwarzenegger. I think he's done a damn good job as our governor, by the way. Uh, the uh, film... twins uh, with Danny DeVito and the little guy and then the big joke uh, throughout the show was that the little guy Danny and the big guy Arnold had the same dad so I had the proud father of the governor of California but I also had the, uh, the joy and the fun of having John Wayne the Duke the referee my first fight in the Marine Corps and then I'm the last guy shot in the shootest which is uh, a great film and by the way, uh, if we have time, I'll we'll talk about that because it was a, everybody in that film that uh, had any kind of a name at all, including Stuart and Dick Boone. Uh, uh, we all asked to be in the film because we felt it would be uh, the Duke's last film that it was. Uh, uh, ours was about the, I think there were about 15 or 16 platoons going through boot. Uh, this is 1943. and. Uh, uh, ours was about the uh, fifth, sixth fight, whatever. And uh, the ringmaster, before uh, uh, turning, starting the fight, uh, introduced uh, the guy to fight for my platoon, which happened to be me. I was about 160 pounds, ringing wet, same length I am now, about six. And uh, then they introduced the guy from uh, the other platoon that I was going to fight against. And he got in the ring, and he was uh, probably the biggest man I'd ever seen in my life at that point. He was about six foot uh, seven, a huge guy, and uh, weighed uh, a little over 300 pounds. He was a, a tackle on Texas A&M football team, and he had enlisted in the Marine Corps. So he was the guy that represented the other platoon. And I looked like a midget next to him. But anyway, uh, the ringmaster said, we got a uh, surprise for you guys, and uh, we have a treat. Uh, there's a man here making a film. His name is John Wayne. He's doing a film here in the San Diego area, and he loves the Marine Corps, so he's uh, volunteered to referee this, uh, this match. So John Wayne is introduced, and he gets in the ring, 
and he looks at this skinny little runt, me, and he looks at this other big guy, and I think it's the only time I ever saw John Wayne look up at anybody, but anyway, he uh, took about two or three seconds, he said, you guys want to fight my rules or Queensberry rules, which are the normal rules of boxing, uh, three minute rounds and a minute or so in between the rounds, and three rounds, and uh, it was not a 10 round or 15 round fight, it was just three rounds because you got to all the platoons from the ball. And we didn't want to argue with him, so we said, like, well, we'll fight your rules. And I can swear he gave me a little wink as he climbed out of the ring. And he didn't stay in the ring. He climbed out of the ring. He picked up the gong from the timekeeper. He rang the gong, and that was it for almost 14 minutes. No, no, no rounds. He just figured the only way that the skinny little one would be able to beat, beat the giant is to make it outrun him. <laughs> So I'm, I'm the guy that taught Muhammad Ali the backward shovel, <laughs> and uh, then he did this film, which turned out to be his last, The Shooters. And uh, I went to Mike Frankovich, the producer, and said, Mike, I, I really feel, really, uh, that it would be, I want to be in this film so bad. He said, you, he said, there's nothing uh, left in there. There's no, you know, Jimmy Stewart's playing the doctor, Dick Boone is uh, playing the, whatever the role was, uh, uh, and of course Lauren Bacall, and uh, Ron Howard, who's now a big producer, was a little, you know, was a young boy, 11 years old, in the film. I said, Mike, uh, please, any, I'll be happy to do a walk-on or anything. He said, well, let me take a look at the script. He called me about three days later, he said, uh, I'm going to, uh, Fax over uh, some of the stuff, take a look at it. And what they did is they took a character in there and they enlarged the, the role. And I said, great, whatever you want me to do. And uh, so I wound up uh, in the film. And it was, uh, you know, really everybody was so proud to be in it. And a lot of us felt that it was going to be his last because he had pneumonia. And he only had, I mean, he had... Uh, Empathy. Emphysema. Well, whatever it was, he lost one of his lungs, so he only had one lung. And uh, as a matter of fact, about halfway through the show, he caught a cold or something and uh, was having trouble coughing, and so we sent him home, and then they decided to shoot uh, around him as much as possible. They did all Lauren Bacall's close-ups. They did um, stuff with me and with Jimmy Stewart and Dick Bone, and finally, uh, there was nothing left to do except the, the gunfight at the end in the uh, saloon. And so we did that gunfight without him being there. We did that whole sequence from his point of view. And uh, in the show, uh, uh, the three guys that he comes up against in the saloon are the town braggart, Dick Boone, uh, and uh, my character, who was a former gunfighter who is now a feral girl in the furrow in the uh, saloon, and I was the last guy uh, that, that, that had the fight. We were, it was in sequence, and that's the way the Duke character in this uh, wanted it to be. But the town braggart, the young boy, uh, when Wayne comes into the bar, he goes to the bar and his back is to us, and uh, the kid decides to take a cheap shot and uh, uh, you know, hits him in the shoulder, actually and Wayne jumps over the bar and the kid runs out. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, now this is all from camera point of view, from, uh, from Wayne's point of view. As he runs out, he gets shot in the back by Wayne, uh, the Wayne character, and falls dead. And uh, then Boone has his sequence, and then finally uh, my character has a sequence, and I <clears throat> come around the edge of the bar and get it between the eyes. By the way, that was the most difficult stunt I've ever done. He did, uh, it was with a, uh, uh, a rifle that uh, shot the, the blood pellet. Uh, and I had to, within an eighth of an inch, come across around the, uh, the bar area uh, in order to be in the right position to get shot here. And uh, I told the director and the guy with the rifle, we're going to do it once, folks. I'm not going to do it a second time. And fortunately, I didn't lose my eye. He caught me right here. And what you see on film is the actual the rifle pellet hitting me. And when it kills the character, he 
finally comes back, and about two or three weeks later, and uh, they were so concerned about him because he only had one lung, and if it went into pneumonia, that would have been it. Uh, anyway, when he did come back, um, we worked in the morning till about 11 o'clock, yeah, 11.30, and uh, the director said, to, okay, everybody else go home, uh, we'll start again tomorrow morning, but we want to show Mr. Wayne. Of the rushes, uh, what we did while he was not here, and uh, also to uh, uh, go home and, and relax and be back at eight and seven in the morning, whatever it was. And uh, the Duke turned to me and said, "You know, let's go on with me. We'll look at the rushes." So I was invited to, you know, go with him, and I did. And I sat next to him, and they showed the rushes, all the stuff we'd done, and we got to the bar sequence, and. Um, he sees what they did with the kid. He gets off the he panics and runs out to get shot in the back. And Wayne said, wait a damn minute. And stands up He said, damn it, I've done 250 films or whatever it is. I've never shot anybody in the back, and I don't intend to start now. And you redo that scene, or you get another boy. <laughs> and so they did, did the scene. He was quite a guy. Yeah, he sounds incredible. He was good to people when he worked with them. I mean, you had that reputation as well as taking care of people. Well, he and uh, Jimmy Stewart, Gary Cooper, uh, Clint Ford, uh, you know, big, big time back then. Uh, they were, to me, always, uh, besides being performers, those, are, those people I just mentioned uh, were really wonderful men. I mean, they were... Uh, Besides being, you know, uh, super big size superstar. I had to be on my P's and Q's with Hugh O'Brien. I've known Hugh for years and I've worked with him and with his charity, but he keeps me on guard all the time. I think you got an, an insight in his wit watching this show tonight, and I hope you'll watch us again. I'm Tommy Garrett with Somewhere in Time. Good night.